All right, all right, all right. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else to Vamp the Collectors. Thank you all for coming out. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause. I am your host, Dustin Markell, sitting in for LeVar Burton. I am a So Say We All board member and a two-time vamp performer myself and producer for tonight's show. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. First things first, just a reminder, we are at a bar, so if you uh, could please uh, pass your empty glasses towards the back so the bartender can keep the drinks flowing. And if folks around you are getting a little too chatty, don't be afraid to give them one of these looks. <sighs> just so we can all enjoy the show. Uh, let's see, uh, who is So Say We All? For those who may not know, we are a literary and performing arts nonprofit. Our mission is to create opportunities for people to tell their stories and to tell them better. We achieve this through our three core priorities, publishing, performance, and education. For our publishing, please check out our table in the back for copies of our latest and latest and greatest bound collections, uh, including uh, the whole alphabet, incoming, uh, the Radvocate, uh, uh, other titles as well. Come get you some. Come get you some. Uh, as for our performance, I mean, you're in it, fam. Welcome to one of our performances. As for education, we offer outreach programs specifically targeting communities who lack access uh, or are underrepresented by mainstream media. Our teaching artists have worked with social services such as the Braille Institute, Penn USA, the Veteran Writers Group, Southern California American Indian Resource Center, Father Joe's Village, San Diego Public County Libraries, and many more. So So We All is a community, not just among its performers and volunteers and board members, but among its audience too. We love sharing our experience with you and we want to hear all about yours. Feel, we feel that the arts help make San Diego a city we all want to live in. Am I right? Am I right? And we feel that our shows help people feel a little less crazy uh, and a little less alone, especially in these isolating times. And so in the spirit of that community, and before our next inevitable mask mandate, I invite you all <laughs> to take out your imaginary camera phones, turn to the person next to you, take a mental picture of their face and say to them, hey, it's good to see you, fam. You, you can also do the click for those born uh, in the 80s or before or anything like that. All right, all right, all right. You ready to hear these stories, fam? I saw you ready to hear these stories, fam? Tonight. Jared Wolfram takes us on a trip down memory lane while Lucky Pence takes us on a trip to the stars. Joe Hudak is a man with uh, a, set of, a special set of skills while Justin Hutnell is definitely not a Cylon posing as a human. <laughs> Leo Degelbaum tells us about his mom who's got gadgets and gizmos aplenty and while a wrong turn leaves Jessica Ruan stuck in traffic. Batting first is a veteran of the vamp stage who's ready for the end of the world to begin, ladies and gentlemen. Fam, give it up for Mr. Brent Hennefy. In 1997, I pestered my parents to let me use the VCR to record a cheesy movie called Asteroid. People think Deep Impact and Armageddon are the granddaddies of space rock disaster movies, but this piece of shit beat both by an entire year. I wanted to watch it because it starred Michael Bean, 
Michael Bean was in Aliens and Terminator and the Abyss. I thought Michael Bean was the coolest motherfucker in the world. James Cameron evidently agreed. In one scene, two fighter jets blasted the incoming asteroid with lasers to pulverize it into chunks that would burn up in the atmosphere. But instead, they created a meteor shower that caused more devastation. I watched wide-eyed on the living room couch as Michael Bean saved little blonde girls while buildings collapsed and cheap special effects incinerated the city of Dallas. It was awesome. <laughs> I was 11. Watching the TV world get destroyed while I sat comfortably in the intact one captivated me, and I've been fascinated by the apocalypse ever since. Any movie, book, or video game that features the end of the world, it doesn't matter if it takes place as the world is actively ending or in the years and centuries that follow. If I can read it, watch it, or play it, I can't get enough of it. It's always been my attempt to make a world in crisis seem like one that I could survive or maybe even thrive in. And as the lines between apocalyptic fiction and reality started to blur last year, I dove even deep into... Deep, <clears throat> awesome. I dove even deeper into this kind of media. It was my effort at processing reality as an invisible plague made a routine visit to the liquor store seem like a life-threatening gamble. So, stuck inside during those uncertain opening weeks of the pandemic, I exercised my standard measure of control when things seemed bleak. I reread Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road. Most people watched the movie Contagion around that time. I did too, but I'm trying to seem impressive and scholarly by bragging that I also read a book. <laughs> the Road is a story about a man and his boy struggling to survive across a journey, str <clears throat> struggling to survive on a journey across a burnt and broken America. In the early days of lockdown, I found its motif of avoiding contact with other Americans particularly useful, but that was the only practical advice in it. The book didn't reveal how to track down a single remaining package of toilet paper in a 30-mile radius. <laughs> it had lessons about how to defend against highway robbery, but my highway commute stopped the moment my company let me work from home. It had plenty of advice about how to be, how to be a good father, but I'm still not a parent, so those lessons didn't apply to me. I read it again because it was a comfort to me at a time when self-care was paramount. The road is brutal, but it remains my favorite book to this day. I always find beauty in the dense ugliness of Cormac McCarthy's world, but most importantly, I considered the main character the very pinnacle of masculinity. The man in the book is so competent and capable, and he has one single-minded goal, keep his boy alive at all costs. At a time when I was unable to visit with anyone except my girlfriend, I enjoyed his company. Each page was, was another opportunity to have a man-to-man -man talk with the guy. Few apocalyptic stories have characters as compelling as that man. Most have shitty characters. But they still allow me to fantasize about being a survivalist, a hero, a protector. It's just fun to think about. I'm fairly handy with a toolkit, but in a real post-apocalyptic society, there's no chance I'd be the guy who successfully repairs the generator, bringing electricity to the small town. But I enjoy imagining myself as that guy. It's sort of like when you pass a driver in distress on the road and you think about being that noble person who stops to help, but by the time you've truly considered it, you're five miles away doing 75 on the freeway, and it's just too impractical to turn around. When I enjoy any standard doomsday story, instead of taking notes and gleaning valuable information, I just crack open another beer and let the fantasy suck me in. Considering how many books, games, and movies I've absorbed about the breakdown of society, you'd think I'd have learned something relevant from them. But in truth, it's shocking how little I've done to prepare for the real thing. I don't have an emergency go bag stocked with MREs and a first aid kit. I don't have jugs of fresh water stored under my sink because I live in a two-bedroom apartment and the cabinet space sucks. <laughs> I have no idea how to forage for food or hunt animals. I don't know how to raise crops. My girlfriend and I have talked for years about growing our own herb garden, speaking of the decision in the same reverent tones as getting engaged or putting a down payment on a house. <laughs> like, should we do it? I feel like it's time. Yeah. We still buy our cilantro at Trader Joe's, <laughs> use about half of it for a single night's worth of tacos, then throw the rest away when it inevitably goes bad. I also don't own a firearm, at least not yet. This is much to my younger brother's displeasure, 
who sees a version of life in which there's an enemy around every corner plotting to invade your home, hurt your family, and take all your shit. In my corner of the world, I don't consider that a likely outcome. But I've seen enough of season three of The Walking Dead to understand the importance of holding the high ground, which is why I'm glad to live on the second floor of my complex. <laughs> and when the Pacific rises up and swallows every first floor unit, I'll probably watch Waterworld. <laughs> Honestly, fantastical narratives are just far easier for me to absorb than the real horrors enumerated on my phone every day. I've made a habit of browsing Reddit and deliberately scrolling past any post referring to rising sea levels, or the burning of the Amazon, or the latest asteroid that has a 0.0004% chance of annihilating life on Earth down to the last microbe. I've turned this avoidance into an art. An article about mercury levels on the rise, endangering global food supply, Skip. A video about the worst drought in California in over a thousand years? Better skip that one too. Wait, what? Jeff Bezos went to space in a rocket shaped like a dick? Now that sounds like an emotionally low stakes article I'll happily read on the toilet. I know it's all happening. I know each one is more of an emergency than the last, but what can I do about it? If the real world is on fire, all I can do is thank the firefighters for their service. So instead of trying to choose which cataclysm to prioritize, I prefer to mainline fictional doomsdays than the factual ones. I'm not the only one who does. The Road won a Pulitzer Prize, after all. Bird Box crushed it on Netflix, and the sequel was immediately greenlit. And not even a global pandemic could stop The Last of Us Part Two, a video game set in the aftermath of a global pandemic from smashing sales records during a global pandemic. It was the darkest, most depressing game I've ever played, and I loved it. <laughs> With every bleak character moment and gut-punching story beat, it was like I could sense every other gamer in the country playing it right alongside me, them and their significant others who, like mine, were nice enough to sit on the couch and watch. That felt like a community at a time when the real community outside my door was the threat. Think about that post-apocalyptic trope where two travelers meet on the road, each one sizing the other up, taking each other's measure to determine who means harm and who's just passing through. Perhaps he has a weapon. Perhaps he's willing to barter for herbs or meat or blankets or, I don't know, chapstick. The penalty for making the wrong judgment call in one of those situations could mean death. The real world coronavirus equivalent of this was Tamer. When I saw an oncoming pedestrian, I played a game I called, Who Would Cross the Street First? <laughs> It depended on how manic I was feeling that particular day. If I was neck deep in will this last forever anxiety, I crossed the street before they did. When I was feeling defiantly optimistic, I refused to deviate. I maintained my course, getting closer and closer to them, just another person like me, out for their daily sanity walk around the neighborhood. Some got closer than others. But at the last moment, they crossed the street. They always crossed the street. I understood. That guy didn't know if I was carrying the virus that got us into this mess. And I didn't know if he, or the labradoodle he was walking, were carriers either. Playing games of sidewalk chicken with my fellow Americans wasn't something I was prepared for. Nor did I prepare for the disintegration of my personal community. My coworkers, men and women I'd grown to rely on and trust and appreciate, all now faceless contacts in a chat room, or pixelated choppy broadcasts, on buggy conference apps. My friends and neighbors, some mere yards away, became risk factors. My own family members became liabilities, and I became one too. I wasn't used to regarding everyone as a potential threat. No one was. For everyone like me, you mourn the loss of whatever their thing was. Dive bars, crowded concerts, renaissance fairs, or just the simple privilege of shaking another person's hand. As far as we were concerned, the world did end. And as the months dragged on, I didn't stop at the road. Caught in the teeth of the infection spike last winter, that's cool. <laughs> I cracked open Stephen King's The Stand, resolving to finally defeat that monster. Reading over a thousand pages about a world devastated by a virus with a 99.4% mortality rate seemed like a way to kill time as cases skyrocketed in Southern California. The stand, like the road, was another useful reminder that things weren't as horrible as they could have been. King's characters, those lucky enough to survive the virus, encountered bloated corpses on a daily basis. 
They were routinely threatened with torture and crucifixion by the forces of darkness. Recognizing I didn't have it as bad as those folks felt like its own measure of control over my situation. And unlike The Road, this book was filled with practical knowledge. I learned that following the collapse of society, bicycles are the most efficient means of travel. I learned you should loot sporting goods stores first and pharmacies second. I learned that if a 108-year-old black woman magically visits you in your dreams and tells you to travel to Kansas, you should do so. By the time I finally turned the last page, my arm was still sore from the first shot. The throbbing pain felt like progress. After my second dose, I went straight to a newly reopened movie theater. I could tell the world wasn't ending because I was in the theater, watching A Quiet Place 2, a film set in a world that already did. With the Moderna pharmaceutical serum coursing through my immune system, I felt like I was wearing my own post-apocalyptic armor, each of my white blood cells equipped in Mad Max-style garb, some wasteland union of rubber tires, spikes, and animal skins. Someday, I imagine I'll have kids of my own, and if I raise them right, eventually they will pester me to let them watch some crappy disaster movie on TV, or they'll just bluntly ask me about the end of the world. I will be able to provide a thorough answer because I've already seen it a million times in stunning 4K resolution. Thank you. Give it up for Brent Hanafy. So I have this box. Really, it's a cheap humidor, but I call it a cigar box. It's a place where I keep an assortment of things that are important to me. And every time I open it, I cry. Everyone has something similar. Maybe it's an old jewelry box or a backpack. Regardless of the container, it's the place where you keep the things that mark your journey through this life. And it isn't the stuff you share with other people. These things don't go in your Instagram story so you can remind your friends your life is better than theirs. It's different. These are the mementos that tell the real truth behind all those staged photos. I've never even talked about my cigar box until now, and I certainly have never told anyone what's in it. But over the years, I steadily accumulated things in this box. A big padlock from 1970s that my dad gave me. A beat up wallet I carried in my back pocket through Operation Iraqi Freedom. A keychain filled with keys, one of which is to the dorm room for my first of four attempts at college. A notepad from the Standard Hotel in LA. A Christmas card from my grandpa and a bunch of other random stuff. It's all the little mementos I unconsciously gathered over time. It's junk, but it's my junk, and it's important to me. A few months ago, I opened the box. First thing I did was cry. Then I picked up every keepsake in the box and thought about how it got there. And in doing so, I realized the entire time that I was with my ex-wife, I only put one thing in that box. <laughs> <laughs> we were together for 12 years and married for seven. Before we split up, I thought everything was going great. We bought a house, she had just put together a surprise birthday party for me, and for the first time in our relationship, we were trying to have kids. After work one day, I made one of my standard weekday dinners. A couple bites into my grilled salmon, she told me that she had reconnected with a guy she dated in college. He was the person she always envisioned herself being married to and having children with. But back in college, he didn't feel the same way about her. At some point, he changed his mind and now had those same feelings for her. And she was still in love with him. She kept talking, but I stopped listening at that point. I just stared over her shoulder and out the window into the garden. I kept thinking, is this real? Or did I get transported into some alternate dimension? What in the actual fuck is happening right now? <laughs> I couldn't make any sense out of it. I remember standing up at the table while she was talking and putting my plate in the dishwasher. It was completely hollow inside. I had never felt like that before, just blank and empty. I wanted to throw up. I don't remember much else from the rest of that night. The details are gone. It was way too traumatic for distinct memories to stick around. But one thing was clear. We are done being married. So I moved out of her house and into an apartment. And when I did, I got rid of everything. I kept my books, my motorcycle, my guitar, and my cigar box. That was pretty much it. My bedroom was empty, except for a mattress on the floor. In the living room, 
There was no furniture. I refused to have anything around that reminded me of her. For the first few days, I didn't even have a place to sit. So I went to Staples and bought the cheapest office desk and chair that I could find. I tend to be on the minimalist side, but this was extreme. I ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner at that desk for months. I felt like I had been exiled. I went from living in a nice neighborhood with great neighbors to being completely alone in this empty apartment. So when we split up, I also ended up with a car. I seriously considered pushing it off a cliff, but I wasn't willing to go that far just to prove a point. I refused to sell it because anything I would have bought with the money would have reminded me of her. And putting the cash in my bank account would have been just as bad. Every time I looked at the balance, I'd have to remember that some of it came from that goddamn car. So I donated a perfectly good vehicle that I easily could have sold for a decent amount of money to the American Legion. That's how far I took the scorched earth policy of getting rid of everything that reminded me of her. Mentally, I was in a terrible place. Heartbreak was part of it, but overwhelmingly, a sense of failure was eating away at me. I needed to figure out what happened. I should have gone to therapy. Instead, I just started walking around the neighborhood. No music, no podcasts, no headphones. Every night after work, I just walk. For some context, I moved into my apartment the weekend before the first COVID quarantine. So it was pretty much just me and some homeless people wandering around the streets of East Village at night. It was fucking early. For hours, I would just walk and think about how I'd failed at marriage. It took me a while, but I finally put my finger on it, or at least a big chunk of it. We moved to California so she could go to veterinary school, which is pretty much the same thing as medical school. It's a super intense commitment for six years. And gradually during that time, every decision I made became about supporting her dreams and ambitions. At the time, it was barely even noticeable. For example, weekends were no longer for road trips. Those were reserved for studying. It seemed silly, but little things like that added up. And there were big things, too. There was a stretch of time where every week I was flying from San Diego to Virginia for work. I'd leave on the first Monday morning flight, get back late on Thursday night. On Friday, I'd drive six hours north to visit her in the Central Valley at her internship. I'd see her for a few hours over the weekend when she had some time, and Sunday night, I'd drive back six hours to San Diego. Monday morning, fly back to Virginia, do it all over again. I did that nearly every week for six months. It was exhausting, and it almost fucking broke me. But did she pressure me into driving up there every weekend to see her? Absolutely not. I made that choice on my own, and there was no doubt in my mind that it was worth it. All those decisions, big and small, accumulated over the years, and they became normal until it all came crashing down. I thought I was doing the right thing by making all these sacrifices for our relationship. I thought it was strengthening our bond, and up to a certain point, I think that was true. But somewhere along the line, the sacrifices I made became harmful, both to me personally and to our relationship. I wasn't living my own life anymore. I was living to support someone else's dreams. And I can't pinpoint the exact moment where it turned toxic, but when but when she decided to start her own practice and I gave her my Jeep to use as her work truck, I was clearly in the destructive phase at that point. Over the years, it became an unspoken rule that between us, when a sacrifice or a compromise needed to be made, it was gonna be made by me. I took it for granted, and so did she. So slowly, on all these walks at night by myself, I was putting all these pieces together in my head. I don't believe in romanticizing about what could have been. I fucking, I hate it when people do that. What happened, happened. I certainly can learn from the past, but I don't get to go back and change it. I can only go forward. And no, bad, no matter how bad things are in the moment, or have, how good things may have seemed in the past, the future will always be better. That's the only way it works. So, after I sorted through a good chunk of this stuff in my head, things turned around for me, as they always do. I met a girl, and life certainly brightened up after that. We took an amazing road trip through southern Utah. We had no real plan, just a vague idea of the route. We hiked through the mountains, watched the sunset. We sat outside at night under the stars and waited for the moon to rise. It was perfect. You can't ask for any more than that. And on that trip, I stopped worrying about things that I couldn't control. For the first time in years, out there in the middle of the desert, I felt truly present in the moment 
and I was happy again. So when I opened up my cigar box and I realized that my wedding ring was the only thing I put in there during the whole time I was with my ex-wife, it all came together. The things in that box remind me of times in life when I was happy and the possibilities seemed endless. Times when I wasn't concerned so much about the future or failure and I had drifted away from that person and that's what brought on the stream of tears. I'd stopped living my own life and I'd stopped putting things in my cigar box. It was a tough path to get there, but eventually I realized that no matter what I did, she was always gonna follow her heart and be with someone else. In the beginning, the sacrifices I made brought us closer together, but I let it become excessively one-sided. And once it got to that point, I was just painfully delaying the end. Relationships are all about compromise, but it has to come from both people. Maybe there's an easy way to learn that lesson, I don't know, but I sure as fuck learned that one the hard way. <laughs> Fortunately, there's still plenty of room left in my cigar box, and it's time to start putting things in it again. Thank you. That's Vamp First Timer, Jared Wolfram. In June of 2020, the app that I use to collect astrological natal charts was bought by a new company and all of my charts, literally dozens of people I had met over the better part of a decade, disappeared. I opened my app to check on a date for a friend and with 10 minutes, I was crying in the back seat of my car, overwhelmed by this sense of guilt and loneliness. I kept all the star charts of everyone I met in a neat little app on my phone. It was organized by date and name and note. So I could scroll through the names and see that last spring I met Steve bartending at that cute underground club. When I tap on the chart itself, I remember clocking his Libra moon and then sharing about my own difficulties, defining the emotional self through relation to others. After a couple drinks, he mentions how even though he's been married and isn't anymore, he's equally frightened of being alone and being in a codependent relationship and neither way feels like himself and will intimacy ever stop feeling like a catch-22? And although that night is over, Steve's name is still on my phone, superimposed over a map of the night sky. The stars are winking back at me, asking me the same questions he did. I met Haley at a party near Mission Bay, and she was so impossibly sweet. We held hands and snuck into the closed pool. After looking at her Gemini moon and Pisces placements, we bond over not knowing when to trust our own emotional sensitivity or when to use a more detached logic instead. She talks about how she's scared of being a parent to even her dog because she knows she'll inevitably use the wrong tool, emotion or logic, and it will hurt them, and some hurts don't heal. So two weeks later, when the moon goes into Gemini above me, I remember the cheap cider and the quiet dark and the way that she smelled like lavender, even in the chlorine stink of the pool. Soul is a fellow poet, and according to the star chart by their name, their Venus is in effervescent Leo. So of course, we talk about the appeal of powerful people. We talk about how fascinating and beautiful self-assuredness is. We flirt. I think we flirt. <laughs> I'm not great at figuring out when it's flirting. And the next time I scroll through the app, I see the Venus symbol, the little circle with the cross by their name. I think of the moment when we didn't kiss each other. I think of the space that not kiss left behind. And I think maybe we just weren't self-assured enough for each other's tastes. And all of those memories will stick because the birth chart is saved on my phone. I'll be able to remember. At first, I didn't realize why the chart's disappearance wrecked me. 
for weeks. I kept asking myself why I was so devastated by the loss of these maps. I could easily ask for the information from people I already knew, and the others weren't a part of my life, so it didn't make sense to be upset over their loss. Why did they matter so much to me? The embarrassing answer is, before I was introduced to astrology, I did not know how to make friends. Or at least I hadn't learned how to make meaningful connections by talking with people. A lot of times when people say they don't like astrology, they're saying they don't like strangers jumping to conclusions about them based on the month they were born. <laughs> hey, that's an incredibly valid response. <laughs> That's also not really what astrology is. I bet all of us have seen articles like, why Pisces are the best wingmen, or Scorpios are Slytherins and here's why. <laughs> and although I've only been at these studies a handful of years, I can tell you that astrology is not Hogwarts. It doesn't take stock character traits and use them to define who you are. In my experience, astrology is much more about asking better individualized questions than about giving answers. <laughs> yeah! Asking big questions with other people is one of my favorite ways to get to know someone. There's nothing interesting to me about saying, you're a Taurus, I'm a Scorpio, we're opposites. But looking at our charts alongside each other, I could ask, Hey, both of our moons are located in the second house. Do you also feel your emotional security is dependent upon having a fixed place to call home? <laughs> and exploring those answers together can actually build compelling connections. I first encountered astrology while working for a New Age-style children's camp. <laughs> All of the employees were required to study it as part of training, and I was healthily skeptical of the whole process. The real game changer was when I met Dawn. Dawn had been directing the camp for 30 years. My first day of working with her was what convinced me to believe in astrology. Within 15 minutes of looking at my birth chart, she was able to accurately pinpoint my most traumatic childhood memories. One by one, she told my coworkers and me about ourselves in the most frighteningly personal ways. She said things like, when you were eight, someone who wasn't your father but felt like your father hurt you very badly, and it's okay that you can't forgive them. Or, your depression is often fetishized by the people you love, which may leave you feeling like your mental illness is what makes you valuable, but you're not a character, and you deserve the healing you're so hesitant to pursue. <laughs> All of this in 15 minutes of observation. And I've since learned that trauma like that is easy to find in the birth chart. The placement and transits of, of Saturn, of Chiron, of Pluto all have the keys to some pretty horrific and incredibly private doors. At the time, however, I was nestled on the couch between two strangers. I was fresh out of college and living thousands of miles from any family, and I was far lonelier than I ever would have been willing to admit. But all of a sudden, these doors to my most personal stories had been wrenched open and some of the oldest, most hurt parts of myself were laid bare. With just my birthday, time, and place, these people I knew for maybe two hours knew more about me than people I had known for the better part of my life. And I knew just as much about them. It felt like using a cheat code, like we skipped the years of trust building that knowledge should have required. And although I got with the program and studied, I listened and taught with Dawn and my coworkers who were suddenly my best friends, part of me hated it. I could blame my Capricorn placements for my bones' deep fear of vulnerability. Dawn certainly did. But in hindsight, in hindsight, the whole process felt like 
She took parts of us without asking and without regard for how much those parts meant to us. After that first day, it was like Dawn decided she knew who I was and stopped asking questions. Looking at my birth chart was the beginning and end of the interest she took in getting to know me. And when I told her things about myself that didn't fit in with her impression, she didn't remember them. She didn't remember me. She looked at my inner child and then she stopped looking. Which hurt all the more because for the first time, I wanted someone I admired to see me. I wanted her to see me. <laughs> Dawn liked to talk about the power of vulnerability. She tried to teach me that opening up could be a source of healing and connection. I never would have believed her if it hadn't been for my coworkers, Maisie and Jacob. They are two of the best friends I've ever had. They were the first people I really fell in love with and astrology was how we communicated. Maisie's ability to make others feel included was labeled as a combination of her nurturing cancer son and her playful Gemini Venus. Jacob's rule-bending mischief was courtesy of his Aquarius son and his Libra rising. <laughs> Where my intense creativity and humor or my Scorpio son and my Sagittarius rising. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we use each other's placements to show affection, to express discomfort, and to empathize with each other. We loved each other, and the stars were our language. But when summer was over, we all went our separate ways. Our lives became disparate again, and the complex emotions of this summer along with the intimacy we built, we're hundreds of miles away from each other with limited ability to communicate. So I started a new life, as alone as I was at the beginning of the summer, but with a shiny new tool and a freshly opened heart. My new life brought new people and I loved them the best way I knew how, with the stars. The following years, I leaned heavily on astrology as a tool for connection. It showed me that everyone had something in common and it provided a language for the things we didn't. It was an assurance that even though life could feel desperately lonely, with just a few moments and bits of information, I could turn all kinds of strangers into meaningful friends, even if it was just for a night. Since the charts disappeared a year ago, I've had to rely on other ways to connect with people. Without them, I realized something I should have seen a long time ago. The charts aren't what made the relationships valuable. Repeating the stories, remembering the moments, they weren't what made the connection important. They were just one way of expressing interest and care. And because there are as many ways to love people as there are people in the world, I'm taking the loss of these charts as an opportunity to learn some new ones. That's a vamp first timer. Lucky pens. I needed two helicopters. In Afghanistan, everyone needed helicopters. Helos were the Ubers of the sky, and it was busy. The fire bases and combat outposts needed their food, water, ammo, and fuel in terrain only accessible by helicopters. Troops needed to move. Others needed to be evacuated. Battlefield commanders needed to visit their troops and get to meetings. Even the Afghans needed helicopters, but there just weren't enough to go around, even for special forces. The conventional military owned them, but I wasn't going to take no for an answer. Didn't this war know who I was, goddammit? It was 2005 and I was a seasoned Green Beret, the senior medic for my team with a decade of service and an overdeveloped disdain for bureaucracy. And like the bureaucracy, I wasn't making any progress in the war. No one was. It was a quagmire, and it was my quagmire. 
I never bought into the propaganda of the Armed Forces Network, and I didn't buy into the mission either. With global powers working behind the scenes at destabilization, there was no way I or anyone else I served alongside could hope to affect meaningful changes. Killing people and breaking things are only a part of what Green Berets do. They are experts in creating and running an insurrection. I believe the State Department was secretly hoping we would create some scaffolding of government and economy for them to swoop in and develop. On this trip, I was the money man for my operation. Every month I went to Kandahar for more cash and I had my previous month's receipts audited. I linked up with the other money men as well. We received hundreds of thousands of dollars each month so that we could infuse money into the local economy. I got an amount comparable to the salaries of all 14 dudes on my team. Being able to comfortably do algebra at a moment's notice meant somehow I meant uh, that I possessed the requisite skill essentially to operate as a payday loan officer for an entire town. It was my job to interface with the outside support entities, military and civilian, U.S. and foreign. I saw the stacks of dingy bills as a central tenant to the Afghan war. That's it. The Afghans just needed more capitalism. There was no loyalty or morality to get in the way. Unfettered allegiance to the almighty dollar was the only religion. Those with the stacks of mo uh, money were the real miracle-working holy men. My monthly trips were a great way to stay connected and distribute scuttlebutt kept up morale. Kandahar was a base full of international 20-somethings trying to run a war with limited intel and even more limited plans. We traded stories and sometimes trinkets with the people we lived and worked with. Spreading good stories was a tradable commodity. Most folks didn't really know what they were doing in the war, let alone who I was and what I was doing. The conventional military folks were on their heels and their confusion fit well with my agenda. They looked to special forces at the experts at everything. And the chaotic nature of the war meant that anyone with a cohesive story and a good background could get anything done. It was a great time to be a smooth-talking, bearded warrior. We got away with all the shit. <laughs> Ambiguous directives made Afghanistan a playground for special forces. We said and did whatever we needed to do to get our objective met. The motto of my unit is, lo que sea, cuando sea, donde sea. Anything, anytime, any place. I live by that. I had the rank and the brass tacks to get it done, and I thrived on it. On one of my monthly finance trips, I decided to see how far my mouth could take me. At the time, the conventional army units were prepping a major operation to move troops to babysit a mountain, path, a mountain pass in the northeast of the country to keep the Taliban from it. I needed two Chinook helicopters to go to a mountain pass in the northwest, which was a staging area for the bad guys. This time, we needed to stack bodies and break shit. I was consistently told to do more with less. It was the motto I financially live by, and it turned me into a creative soldier. What, what I lacked for in finances, I made up for in bravado. Green Berets, by nature, are talkers, salesmen. We could talk our way into or out of just about anything. Once, I couldn't afford a landscaping crew to maintain my landing zone, so I paid a local goat herder a dollar a week to remove the foliage. Problem solved. <laughs> By the end of my nine-month trip over there, that guy had turned into a wealthy rancher based on $1 a week addition. The two biggest marketable commodities that Special Forces had were our knowledge and our toys. When operating outside of regulations and norms, bartering becomes the, the monetary system, similar to prison, I imagine. Everyone had their individual decompression downrange, which meant everyone had a different desire. Some chose video games, others pushed plates in the gym, my hobby was engaging in the attention of the various special forces groupies who appeared anywhere and everywhere we went. I got to know the units around us by inviting them over for a barbecue and some range time, hoping to capitalize on the favor later. Downrange ulterior motives were the only motives. Rock their world with massive amounts of grenades, mortars, anti-tank rockets, explosives, and belt-fed machine guns, throw some steak down their gullets, butter them up with some whiskey and cigars, and boom you got new friends that you can count on forever. <laughs> my ego told me my operation was way more important than what the conventional military was doing. The Hilo unit had to see that. They wouldn't dare deny my request. Armed with nothing but a fifth of Jack Daniels and an overinflated sense of self, I landed in Kandahar Airfield and began to figure out who I could barter with to get what I needed. There were three different sections of the military across all branches. The fighters, the office workers, and the doers. 
The doers maintained everything. The fighters broke everything. The office workers kept the doers and the fighters from doing or fighting anything. <laughs> they weren't malicious in nature. It was just that they were following inane policies and procedures that were set forth by young officers listening to the good idea fairy sitting on their shoulder. But it made little sense to a fighter like myself. I had a great relationship with the doers. They were magicians, always seeming to get the aircraft, the generator, the satellite array up and running at a moment's notice in any condition. I love those guys and gals. The office workers, on the other hand, said no to everything. <laughs> at every admin desk was a man, woman, or child with O1 rank on their collar telling me no. <laughs> they were the keepers of the almighty paperwork. To go on my annual vacation required me to interface with 16 other people, do all their paperwork, then take those forms to another person to ensure that all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted. It took four weeks to take five days of vacation. An army marches on its stomach, but only after the admins process the paperwork. So when I asked the helo maintainers what they needed to get more air, uh, helos airworthy and available for use, they told me they couldn't get the right seat belts. Of all the roadblocks, it had to be seat belts. No one actually wore the seat belts. <laughs> the brand new interpreter who just rolled into country might wear the seat belt once. But I thought this was combat, and it came with inherent risks. The troop seat belts in the back were an afterthought to keeping the aircraft from falling out of the sky. On most of the operations I did with the Chinooks, the backs were loaded to the gills like cans of beans turned on their sides. Safety inspections and protocols were in the realm of the office workers, and they were unbending on those protocols. Folks had to walk around with the reflective belts on so they could be better seen. What kind of combat force tries to be better seen? Anyway, no seat belts meant no troops in the back, which meant I couldn't have the Chinooks yet. Cool. Where could I get the seat belts? It mattered little that the doers couldn't get it through their system because my green hat told me I could turn water into wine. I would never get the seat belts in time as snail mail would take about six weeks or more to get to the destination. I needed options, accomplices. Being far from home and having the mail take so long really lent to bartering, so I got to work. On CAF, there was a boardwalk for the troops to relax at. Think of a third world version of a shitty strip mall with weird food and strange wares. <laughs> Multiple wooden vending stalls with all manner of decorative tchotchkes. The entire structure reminded me of Home Depot. The boardwalk was the culmination of a bunch of dads who were told to build a deck, given all the tools and wood in Afghanistan, and then left unsupervised for five months. <laughs> The boardwalk was teeming with odd uniforms clustered together and chatting in their own languages. Many groups were a mix of uniforms, truly the international coalition that President Bush had thought to create. <laughs> it was my stalking grounds for folks who could help me. These troops will tell you everything that is wrong with their unit and leadership. They will complain when there is nothing to bitch about. They were the folks with the moral flexibility to do the things outside of the regulations. It's all about relationships and how to scratch that itch you just can't reach downrange. The SF guys could get all kinds of things to make one's deployment a little more comfortable, and the conventional military folks from around the world knew it. Scarcity created instant popularity. From my perch at the boardwalk, I was able to chat up the other international troops and find out what units were there and what basic equipment they had. I hung out with the Brits and learned how the Aussies were having a vacation in the stand compared to Her Majesty's troops. The French complained to me about how inefficient and uncoordinated the Americans were, as though I could possibly affect that. And the Canadians were just happy to have anyone to talk with them about their mission. <laughs> yeah. I learned that the Brits had the seatbelts I needed, and their morale was in the toilet probably due to their expectation of hierarchical and sensible aristocracy mixed with the shit show that was American strategy at the time. I weaseled my way into talking with their senior NCO. The guy looked at my Merrill shoes, desert camo pants, KBR sweatshirt, beard, and team hat for what seemed like an eternity. I needed this guy to be receptive to my pitch. 
Without any of the expected British polish, he started bluntly, Oi, what are you doing in my hangar? <laughs> Not the uh, opening I had hoped for, but I could roll with that. I'm Joe, I began. I'm new in the area, and I wanted to get to know the folks to my left and right. He relaxed a bit. Roger that. Who are you with then? Special Forces Group, other side of the parking lot. You guys uh, adjusting okay? My guys are bitching about the 12 on, 12 off, everyday schedule. If they wanted to do cool shit, they should have gone over there with you guys. Bingo, I was in. <laughs> Everyone wanted to train with me and my guys. Boredom was the biggest enemy for the folks on Kandahar. After further discussion, he agreed that it would be motivating for his troops to get some range time with special forces. I offhandedly mentioned my role that brought me to CAF, as well as my quest for seatbelts and he jumped at the chance to reciprocate. I made it happen. I used my SF brothers to get the time. I just needed guns, bombs, and ammo to really make it rock. The Canadian special ops guys, they had that next door, but they needed steaks for a barbecue they were planning. Good steaks. Not the freeze-dried, pseudo-jerky, sorry you're here steaks. The ones used to tell you, hey, you've been involuntarily extended here. They needed the good cuts that everyone knew were only found in the Special Forces Chow Hall. I had friends there, and I still had a fifth of Jack Daniels. I traded the whiskey for the steaks. The steaks were all the RPGs, machine guns, explosive possible. Shortly after that, a fresh box of helicopter seat belts landed on my desk. Delivered by my cockney bloke, my newly minted buddy, his smile wider than the box. <laughs> the following day, I sauntered into the helicopter hangar, hefting the precious cargo for my southern friends in the helicopter maintenance unit, like some dystopian Santa Claus in desert camo. <laughs> A week later, my team and I sat in the Chinooks alongside our Afghan commandos, watching the last of the spring snow swirl in the rotor blades at, at sunset. I had morphed a bottle of contraband whiskey into two mission-bound helos. But in a war that expected success from its warfighters, yet achieved little of its own, my contribution felt insubstantial. As we watch and witness the exit of Western control from Afghanistan, while the Taliban retake the country, I feel now what I felt then, everything but surprise. There was no other way for this war to end. The US was never going to establish a permanent military civilian infrastructure. The decentralized and tribal nature of the country hampers any type of nation building. Afghanistan has been conquered and controlled by external entities for generations. There is hardly a scaffolding of a government for nations to work with. But if I could talk my way into acquiring a couple of helos, maybe I could talk my way into the Army Special Mission Unit, a mighty tier above my own. Perhaps I could have a substantial contribution in that unit. And as the aircraft's wheels broke free of the grip of the earth, heading into the Hindu Kush mountains, I remembered I knew a guy in that unit. I gave him a call when I got home. That is another vamp first timer, Joe Hudak. I mean, can you dig it, ladies and gentlemen? Can you dig it? Uh, our next performer uh, is not a first timer, is not a stranger to the VAMP stage. He's, in fact, the executive director of So Say We All and a fellow only child. So please give it up for Justin Hutnall. I invite you all to imagine my mother's life while I, her only child, was serving overseas with the United Nations in Juba, South Sudan. She was 54, living with her Newfoundland puppy in San Diego, worried about me, but making an effort not to add to my stress. Before deploying, my mom and I had talked by phone nearly every day, but half a planet away, we were down to trading emails once a week. She missed hearing from me, but understood the constraints of the job. Most of our, of our exchanges were purposefully banal. Questions about what I'd been eating, always goat. 
and some enlightening variation of me letting her know that the desert was really, really hot. <laughs> to prevent some anxiety on her part when our compound was attacked, I decided to let her know in a concise and emotionless message, keeping details light and omitting entirely the fact that myself and others had been wounded. She'd handled it well from what I could tell, wanting to make sure I was okay, but refraining from having a panicked reaction. She trusted me to make sound decisions and to talk more about it when I was ready, whenever that was. I now invite you to imagine my mother as she returns home from her job the week following this attack to discover a very large cardboard box sitting on her front porch. She bent over to pick it up, but it was so heavy she had to drag it across the threshold. She cut it open so she could let me know what had arrived the next time I emailed and paused as she discovered dozens upon dozens of individually packaged die-cast spaceships inside. <laughs> I imagine she decided to sit down and have a glass of wine after that, <laughs> to talk herself into seeing it as something other than evidence of a manic episode, and resolved to wait a few days before she brought it up. And then the second box arrived. <laughs> even heavier than the first. And still no email from her son. UNICEF's Juba office had a satellite internet connection with a speed slightly faster than the dial-up days of the mid-90s, or in teenage boy terms, PIPM. That's one still pornographic image per minute. <laughs> Those who know, know. Our highest ranking officers had a few Thuraya satellite phones capable of making calls from anywhere in the world for around $10 a minute, which meant I'd stand a better chance of getting my hands on a Kalashnikov if I'd wanted one because the Chinese AK-47s flooding North Africa cost less than a 30-minute phone call. But I didn't want a Thuraya, and my avoidance with calling home was out of choice rather than circumstance. It wasn't that there was nothing to talk about, but that communicating back home had become more alienating than bonding. The lack of privacy in my duty station, the labor of writing emails, my unwillingness to burden or upset someone I cared about by being too honest about what was actually going on, made connecting to a loved one so generally disappointing that I quickly figured out why most of my coworkers had stopped trying long ago. The one person I did keep up with over Instant Messenger, that desktop ancestor to modern mobile texting was a close friend and coworker from New York, Leah. It was an intentional choice. <laughs> We'd been nothing but platonic drinking buddies who didn't know each other anything and never probed too deep. She would tell me about a bad date she'd gone on and I would vehemently reinforce what a terrible douchebag he was, regardless of the offense, whether he'd hit on her friends or refused to eat her out or both <laughs> if it was the same guy. Because that's what friendship rituals demanded, goddammit. But one time she asked me how my weekend had gone and I told her about a little explosion that had happened out by the airstrip which had left us, left us low on things like food and toilet paper, LOL. <laughs> it turned out that Unexploded artillery, sh it turned out that an unexploded artillery shell or bomb had been buried in the bushes probably since the last civil war in South Sudan. And when somebody in the refugee camp nearby lit their cooking fire, it had spread to the bramble patch where the bomb lay. The heat cooked off the igniter, and for a few hours, every peacekeeper and aid worker in South Sudan thought we were going full tilt into the shit. But quirky little mishaps like unexploded ordnance being discovered like someone like me pissing in the wrong bush had been happening since the day I had arrived. These moments enlivened an otherwise boring day gave us new conversation topics in the evenings and made us all feel a little high off the adrenaline. I mean, excitement without war injuries was really just our version of a courtesy cocaine bump. <laughs> but Leah said nothing, and I realized too late that I had maneuvered us onto a topic for which no ritual existed. Sensing that people are 
Oops, excuse me. Sensing that people are embarrassed or uncomfortable makes my skin crawl. It's why I can't support people who take improv classes just because their barbecue friends tell them they're funny. Those are bad friends. I realized only the most curated or trivial parts of my career with the UN were fit for public consumption. War stories should stay in a bottle on the top shelf and only come down for other people who knew how to drink them. Before deploying to South Sudan, I loaded up a video iPod with all five available seasons of Battlestar Galactica. And once I arrived, I disciplined myself into only watching one a week to make them last longer. Don't count the days, make the days count. Previously, I'd been on the Star Trek side of the sci-fi spectrum, but when a friend introduced me to Battlestar Galactica, I became obsessed. I mean, here was a series that began with the almost total genocide of the human race, with confused survivors forced to militarize overnight with obsolete weapons and fight through one uncomfortably stressful episode after another for survival often failing. The show coined the trick of callously killing off main characters a decade before Walking Dead or Game of Thrones debuted. Characters who sullied their own humanity with ethically bankrupt choices and were no more morally pure than the force trying to murder them was entirely evil. This was the first show I had ever seen that addressed the post 9-11 world head on. A show I'd been desperately searching for because I'd been in New York on 9-11. And it even echoed my own political sentiments at the time, which could be summed up as wanting to see Osama bin Laden hanging from a meat hook over the World Trade Center rubble right next to George Bush and all of his cronies. You know, tit for tat. <laughs> but it wasn't the politically insightful aspects of Battlestar Galactica that carried me through my many lonely nights overseas. Its ability to touch on topics like colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, and the ironic capacity of the oppressed to inflict genocide as soon as the opportunity presents itself. No. No, no. No, it was the pure fantasy elements of Battlestar Galactica that made it my panacea. Specifically, how its beleaguered tribe of protagonists, floating all alone in a sea of darkness, when pressed, could still drop a fucking nuke on their enemies from orbit. <laughs> when my team in Juba had got attacked, it was in the pitch black of Odark 30. And it was hand-to-hand -hand combat all the way down to our camp cook, which is a sign that things are not tactically going very well. <laughs> the morning light showed us broken faces, our friends' blood staining the walls, and colleagues medevaced in the middle of the night without any word afterwards on whether or not they'd survived. My reaction was a strong desire to never shut the fuck up about the fact that we all almost died like Heart of Darkness cosplayers. <laughs> but we couldn't do our jobs well if we spent every minute thinking about what might go wrong. So instead of talking, we just drank even more warm beer than we had before, smoked cartons of cigarettes, probably cut with hay, had marginal sex with uh, anyone we encountered willing from another unit, and never let the conversation go darker than stories about bad dates. Even the Kenyan doctor tasked with pulling a piece of shrapnel out of my eye with no forceps and anesthesia could not have cared less that I was not handling the operation well. <laughs> because the place to unpack things like that is not while they're still happening, even amongst each other. So I kept my mouth shut. I punched a few mirrors. Maybe I got drunk and climbed over some barbed wire. Who knows? <laughs> I tried to get my hands on an AK-47. And finally, I decided I needed a fucking hobby. In the hours I couldn't sleep late at night, after the last of us had gone to bed and all the beers were gone, and there was no one left to talk or laugh with, I'd wander the roof of our compound. I'd stare up at the sky, thinking about the next episode of Battlestar Galactica I'd get to watch the following Friday, and fantasize that there was an interstellar aircraft carrier just waiting to jump into view and rain down the cavalry that all of us knew was never gonna come. Some days after the attack, I'd squirrel away a few minutes to Google the show while sitting in my office, which was a metal trailer with a hole cut in the side for an AC unit. On one of those days, 
I discovered a line of toys that the Battlestar franchise had licensed. Now, the neckbeards back home were snatching them up. So, I decided to just buy the entire line without a thought of what I'd do with them. And then I moved on to collecting Babylon 5 spaceships and Star Trek spaceships and Star Wars spaceships, even the prequels. Yeah. Low point. Any spaceship that I could have a revenge fantasy about showing up the next time we were attacked, cutting our enemies into ribbons before things got so bad that we had to recruit yet another cook, I bought and shipped home. And though I didn't know it at the time in doing so, I was taking part of a military coping mechanism almost as old as war itself. You got Chinese terracotta warriors, Pokemon on Nintendo DS, Ford F-250 Vetmobiles with heinous <laughs> APR financing. People at war have collected weirder shit when they couldn't talk about being scared. Now, when I finally did come home, my mom had dragged all the boxes of spaceships into my old bedroom for me to deal with. The internet was adamant that their value was tied to them being kept in their original packaging, but I tore open every one of them. I just wanted to feel their power in my hand. But they were just fucking toys. So I crammed them all into a plastic blue bin and left it in my mother's attic, never to be opened again. Calm down, nerd. <laughs> It's been over a decade now since I've left the UN. I've made barbecue friends of my own who don't ask probing questions and who I do not listen to when they tell me I'm funny. Psychological wounds are less bothersome now than psychological ones, than, excuse me, than physical ones. I found peace in throwing out old stuff to make room for new stuff. Even though it now it forces me to confront that blue plastic bin again. And I figure eventually what I'll do is I'll make friends with someone who has a kid who isn't a total piece of shit. <laughs> you know, the kind of sweet little nerdy indoor kid. And I'll decide to make their whole year by giving all the spaceships to them. But part of me worries that it'll backfire, that what if the toys are cursed now? I mean, what would happen when that awesome little kid got old enough for the toys to stop holding their attention fully, and they wandered outside, and looked up at the stars, and imagined themselves in some far-off distant land fighting for what they believed was right? What if the toys made them actually go? without ever really considering that if they went, they'd be going totally and completely alone. Thank you. Justin Hodnell, everybody. Our family room was filled with dozens of Billy the Singing Bass. He's a fake novelty fish mounted on a trophy plaque that does a little song and dance when you push a button. They were on sale at CVS Pharmacy and my mother had stockpiled them because they would make great gifts. In the closet next to them were clapping monkeys with cymbals and singing mechanical parrots that would also make great gifts. Upstairs were purses with giant clocks in the front because, again, they would also make great gifts. And all these things accumulated in our house, and most of them never left. In our basement were boxes upon boxes filled with every school paper we'd ever written and every teacher's lesson plan she'd ever composed. Every surface of the house also bulged with thousands of videotapes 
a very special episode of Family Ties or Silver Spoon or any show tangentially related to Israel or Judaism that aired in the 80s or 90s. These video treasures occasionally contributed an AV component to her religious school curriculum, but again, most of them just piled up. It was the same with the sequin dresses from the 80s, bedazzled jean jackets, track suits covered in puffy paint, toys we had outgrown, spices congealed into blocks. Everything my mother owned fit into one of four categories. I've been looking for that. This is very valuable. It's, it's a gift for someone else, and it's important to me. Don't you dare throw anything out. When my parents retired to Dallas a decade ago from Maryland, I flew in to help her declutter. We were sifting through the hurricane of loose papers and she looked at each one agonizing. Delighted, she suddenly handed me my kindergarten diploma, which I promptly placed in a trash bag. Don't, don't you wanna save this? Would an employer ask me for this one day? Sure, you have a college degree, but did you graduate kindergarten? <laughs> I told her that if she looked at every piece of paper, it would be a cherished and valuable memory. If she threw it out without looking at it, she'd never miss it. When they moved, literally everything she had went into boxes, which piled into their new garage. Years later, I found musty pillows, a broken ghetto bass, Blaster like John Cusack used in Say Anything. <laughs> Old magazines and junk mail. When she caught me tossing something out, she would lose her mind. What are you doing with those toy cars? They were my nephews, and he hasn't touched them in a decade, and he's a teenager, and they're literally in an old crock box. Please save them. He's 16, and he has a real car. He doesn't need them. <laughs> The house in Dallas kept getting worse. All the valuable clutter from the old house combined with the new valuable clutter, and I still tried to reason with her because I accepted this as her choice. And I never accepted that maybe it was also a compulsion. The day I realized we were never gonna have a rational conversation, I was stumbling around the room she used for guests, hitting myself on all the crap she had in there. In the corner was a dusty five-disc CD changer with dual cassette decks at the base. It came with two enormous speakers attached by thin wires. She saw me taking it outside to the trash, and she cornered me. <laughs> Leo, I use this all the time, and you can't replace it. They don't even sell them anymore. You're lucky to find one on eBay, and it's hundreds of dollars. I showed her that you can easily buy them at Walmart for under $100, and she hasn't used this in a decade. Then I went through the house and made a tower of the nine other CD player <laughs> cassette deck combos and stacked them next to the 130 rolls of paper towels in the garage. I asked her what sort of horrific misfortune would have to befall her to not only have nine CD players break, but be engaged in a life or death situation where she had to put multiple CDs on different cassette tapes. <laughs> Crying dramatically and pleading, she watched me put it back and checked the next day that it was still there. On my next visit, it went out on the street corner a block away, and she never knew it was gone. I joined my father and my brothers in discreetly throwing things out when we could. I did get caught once with a stack of 35 millimeter cameras missing their backs and a one megapixel digital phone that were broken and I was forced to put them back in the drawer. She was never going to get rid of things. There's not gonna be a purge. It's just too emotional for her. I think it's more than her just being a ref former refugee with Holocaust parents because it's not just the valuable hand-me-downs. It's the plastic junk, the broken things, the outdated technology. And I know eventually we will throw everything out. The stuff that matters to her is the stuff that weighs the whole family down. It's the stuff that forces my father's clothes into cardboard boxes and out of the closet filled with her outfits. I gradually stopped trying and my visits became less frequent and shorter. The arguments still endured over rotted vegetables in the fridge that would go into a soup, expired dairy products, and the individual packets of butter and Parmesan cheese. Three years ago, I lost my older brother. 
Uh, it was tragic addiction spiral, and it pained me to see my parents so broken. I realized that I couldn't keep my distance anymore, and, and they needed me. So I decided I would go down once a month to help, and I just didn't know what to do with all my time down there. I'm not the sort of person who's good at just sitting around. I have ADHD. I, I want to fix things, and things still seemed out of control with all her clutter. But in the back of my mind, I also knew that hidden away in boxes were the things I really cared, out, cared about, the memories she had recorded. In addition to everything else, my mother was always the sort of person who was never without a recording device. In fact, she even claimed she filled my birth in a mirror because my father couldn't hold the camcorder straight. <laughs> And somehow the act of capturing it was more important than whether her maybe someday gay son would ever want to gaze into her. <laughs> I thought of inheriting these stacks of media and not knowing who the people were and not having anyone to ask. My parents are both overweight with long lists of health problems. They are fading. One day, I will not be, asked to be able to ask my mother who she was posing with. What was the celebration? Why was she laughing? I realized there was a way I could get control and give my parents an escape from the grief. I needed to become the family historian, and we were just running out of time. I started with the boxes of slides. I bought a machine that connected to my laptop, and I made my way through the memories that used to appear projected on the screen in a basement. No one had looked at them since 1983. By the time I was done, I'd scanned 9,000 slides. I discovered a past that predated me. My mother thought she had no pictures of herself as a teenager, but my grandfather had hundreds in a box. There were moments of time we could walk through together. She could laugh and share them on Facebook. She marveled at how young everyone was. And of course, I wasn't allowed to throw out any of the slides because, hey, maybe we'd have a slideshow party one day. <laughs> In the mountains of videotapes, there were thousands of hours of home movies, too. We'd been in a standstill for years over digitizing these. She was petrified and opposed to mailing anything out because they could get lost. Meanwhile, the tapes were disintegrating. So I secretly shipped out a box of videos to a company, and I emailed my mother a link where she could watch her wedding, laugh at the Passover Seder where my uncle dressed up like Santa Claus. <laughs> in delight in herself as a young mother. She forwarded them to distant relatives and counted the likes on social media. Over the next couple years, I went through the tapes trying to figure out what was important, me telling her no one wanted my younger brother's grainy soccer game or the third grade play where I had a line. And I know that soon we'll have to sell the house to pay for my father's medical bills. To be honest, it would take a lifetime to sift through all the things she'd collected. A uh, Marie Kondo thing, I've documented walking through all the valuables in the house and recorded the stories behind them. And we'll probably have to hire an estate company to go through the house. What really matters is knowing that all these people are still alive and I can hear their voices and I can study their faces. I can be a kid again. My parents are forever beautiful and skinny. I know my grandparents retelling their Holocaust stories will never be lost. All the bar mitzvah parties where we were just young and happy and will never dim. And as my parents fade, as their memories go, as their health gets worse and worse, we can always escape back to a better past. Leo Deckelbaum, give him a hand. Thing about buying drugs off strangers. <laughs> it's actually a lot trickier than you think. You need a story, you need a plan, you need the right look. It's actually really difficult to pull off. But I'm 25% wasted off stolen bottom shelf vodka and filled with artificial confidence in my abilities. So when I see a tweaker on a busted ass BMX bike do a handoff outside Rite Aid, I can't pass it up. He's like some kind of messed up half man, half bike centaur, and like a suicidal moth, I bravely fly right into that beautiful death flame and hatch a misguided master plan in my half-buzzed brain. 
I quickly kind of smear my makeup and mess up my hair, tug up my clothes. I want to make my myself look more disheveled and harmless. I decide I'm going to play the part of a traumatized damsel in distress. You'd be surprised at how many Captain save a hose there are out, out in the seedy <laughs> underbelly. <laughs> out in the seedy underbelly of society who are desperate for a quick and dirty way to redeem themselves. <laughs> Addict tip number one, when buying dope from a stranger, don't let him approach you first. Don't approach him first, let him come to you. So I sit down on the curb, close but not too close. I start kind of breathing heavily and rocking back and forth and summoning panic and confusion in my eyes. I'm trying to go for this innocent girl who needs help but not crazy chick who's going to be a burden. In a single like meth-fueled motion, he rides up next to me on his rusted bike. Hey, what you need? He asks. My plan seems to be working. I launch into a daytime soap opera sob story about how I was just thrown out on the street by my abusive boyfriend who got me hooked on heroin, and now I'm homeless and dope sick and totally helpless. He is convinced. Our Captain save -a bicycle tweaker reassures that me that he can help me get well. He asks me if I have any money. I've been surviving off stolen vodka and hot Cheetos for two days, so no, bro, I don't have any fucking money. <laughs> But I do have an EBT card with $200 in food stamps on it. So I take out my wallet and I wave my card in the air like it's a goddamn Amex black card. <laughs> and I'm trying to impress someone out of my league. Yeah, that's cool. Follow me. I know a guy. With absolutely no further instructions or information, Bicycle Tweaker just zips away into traffic on his rusty bike. He's maneuvering at an alarming speed the despite the fact that his bike is basically held together with duct tape. Bicycle Tweaker is now winding down alleys and back roads for like an hour. Somehow I'm struggling to keep up, even though, even though I'm the one with a car. So we end up in an alley off Elkhorn Boulevard, and Bicycle Tweaker tells me, wait in my car while he gets a guy. Suddenly, this linebacker of a dude just appears next to my car. Without a word, he opens my passenger door and just kind of lets himself in. I feel the weight of the car tip to one side trying to absorb this massive, unexpected guest. He tells me his name is Traffic, and that I'm going to drive him around for a while. Our bicycle tweaker friend is way long gone by now. His kind primarily functions as these kind of like dark fairy godmother street guides. They just, they just kind of pop up when you're down and usher you from one fucked up adventure to the next, and then they just vanish without a trace. So now I'm sharing a really close space in the same car that I'm living in with this giant, seemingly mute dude named Traffic. If Bicycle Tweaker was a dark fairy, Traffic was like the gnarly ass ogre who lives in the wilderness, like the street version of Shrek. And all the villagers knew not to fuck with him. I can hear the half full handle of vodka rattling around my in the back of my driver's seat at what seemed like an impossibly loud volume compared to the deafening silence in the car. I have no fucking idea where we're going, what's going on, or what's gonna happen when we get there. I'm like 50% wasted now and I'm struggling just to drive straight. So we continue on like this for like two hours. Finally, traffic directs me. <laughs> Finally, he takes me to this apartment complex and says, come inside this time, meet my connect. I eagerly burst out of the car like a kid who just endured a long ride, car ride to Disneyland. This is it, I think to myself. Now try not to stumble up these stairs and look like an asshole. I'm like 70% wasted. <clears throat> Addict tip number two, learn how to suck it up and play cool when you have to. So the Connects apartment is your standard issue tweaker pad. The lighting makes your skin look yellow. It feels like there's not enough air in the room. And the couch has this layer of grime that kind of acts like a protective film. <laughs> the people are skinny, but friendly. It's still early. And their collective paranoia hasn't hit them yet. That comes later. Apartment tweakers are kind of like the goblins of the drug world. <laughs> <laughs> they, 
they kind of like hunker down as a group in like dark out of the way places and connect and collect these like shiny useless tchotchkes for projects that will never actually happen. So someone passes me a meth pipe. Ugh, I fucking hate meth. I came here looking for the exact opposite of meth. Addict tip number three, when you're with shady people doing shady shit and they offer you drugs, you just do them. The last thing you wanna do around a bunch of strange tweakers is give them a reason to be suspicious of you. Plus it's just rude to say no. <laughs> <clears throat> So now it's time for me to fulfill my end of the bargain. So me, Traffic, and the Connect walk to the grocery store. I hand Traffic my EBT card and give him my PIN number and wait outside. I'm now 75% wasted and 40% spun. So like 20 minutes later, tra <laughs> Traffic comes charging out of the store towards me, holding my EBT card up in the air and waving it like he's on a warpath. He's fucking pissed. What went wrong? Why is he so mad? The balance on this fucking card is zero, bitch. Oh shit, that's why he's mad. <laughs> it feels like the entire parking lot is gonna swallow me whole. The combination of meth and fear and adrenaline is now completely overpowering the alcohol and I'm pretty sure my heart's gonna explode. I can see the connect still inside the store. He's standing in front of the cashier and like digging around in his pockets and apologizing. And he has this embarrassingly full shopping cart full of food that he has no way to pay for now. It's two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon and I've somehow managed to screw over two random drug dealers immediately after getting high with them. How is this my life right now? Here's the deal. I'm not even trying to burn anyone. I'm not even trying to be slick. I'm literally just so fucked up that I don't know what day it is and that my EBT card hadn't reloaded for the month yet. My bad. <clears throat> I immediately launch into an Oscar-winning parking lot apology tour. I give Traffics Connect the rest of my stolen vodka as a peace offering. Approximately 27,000 I'm sorry's later, he kind of seems okay with the situation. I thank the Connect for his meth and hospitality. <laughs> and traffic and I are back in the car on the road to, in the car on the road. With a heady mix of speed and adrenaline kind of power washing my brain, I'm now 10% wasted and 5,000% spun. The awkward silent style in the car is now on full blast. Traffic is convinced that I just scammed him. He also decides my whole damsel in distress routine is total bullshit. He gets really quiet and looks at me for a long time. My brain goes into panic overdrive. Is his nickname Traffic because he's a human trafficker? <laughs> Am I about to be kidnapped? Maybe he'll just steal my car and be done with me for the day. Instead, traffic just sits, inches away from me in the passenger seat. He sits and he stares, like he's trying to figure me out. The suspense has almost completely killed my buzz. I'm 5% wasted and 7,000% paranoid. <clears throat> Finally, in a very monotone, annoyed voice, he says to me, you're one of the best liars I've ever met. You fucking scare the shit out of me. <clears throat> he goes really quiet again. Then miraculously, Traffic says to me, come on then, let's go get you some smack, girl. I still got you. <laughs> like he's talking to his little sister who just had a temper tantrum, but he's still gonna take me out for ice cream even though I don't deserve it. <laughs> so we end up at this girl Marla's house in Normal Heights. She's in bed dope sick, but she seems friendly enough. She has two dogs, one of them is wearing a diaper. She's like 31, so we're pretty much the same age. After a brief round of introductions, we all just kind of pile into her California king bed and shoot dope together. Sharing this ritual kind of soothes any remaining anger or awkwardness that lingers between traffic and I. In a matter of minutes, we're no longer enemies, strangers, or adversaries of any kind. 
I am 85% high on heroin and 100% content, finally. I quickly discover that Marla is really into MMA fighting. <laughs> but like a lot. She used to be a fighter in her past life before heroin. Even in our addictions, us addicts tend to cling to these old abandoned hobbies, kind of desperately trying to keep the ghosts of who we used to be alive and telling ourselves one day that we'll pick it all back up again. It's how we convince ourselves that we haven't given up on real life yet. We're just kind of taking a break. So we start watching these videos of MMA fighters and then like reenacting the wrestling moves on each other. It gets pretty intense. Traffic wants me to like put him in a chokehold. Harder, harder, he yells at me. At one point I have to actually stop and tell him I don't want to be responsible for crushing his Adam's apple. Addict tip number four, don't accidentally break your drug dealer's neck. <laughs> we laugh and play and wrestle like we've known each other for 20 years. Finally, Traffic and I kind of tumble out into the alley to smoke a cigarette. He looks at me and says, hey, can I ask you something? Oh, fuck. I thought to myself, here it comes. What am I going to have to do? What does he want me to do? He looks really nervous. He gets really serious all of a sudden. He says, do you like ping pong? <laughs> sure. Yeah, OK, whatever. <laughs> cool, because I fucking love ping pong. And Marla never wants to go play with me. <clears throat> Addict tip number five, childhood pastimes are actually really fun to do when you're super high. <clears throat> so off we go to the Adams Avenue Rec Center to play some ping pong. Inside, it's kind of small and seedy and abandoned. It's the perfect final setting for this strange adventure. Traffic gets us paddles and this janky old ball. We play ping pong like two kids on a sugar high who just did school for the first time. We don't even keep score, but I was definitely winning. We're under the spell of a shared altered state. Any lingering anger traffic has towards me dissolves with each swing of our ratchet ping pong paddles. Bound by the ties of our own addictions, we find this false sense of freedom in a whimsical afternoon escape. Addict tip number six. When you spend 80% of your waking life alienated by addiction, even temporary friendship based solely on ping pong kind of feels like a miracle. Traffic and I's relationship progresses insanely fast. We go from strangers to acquaintances to like ride or die BFFs in like two hours. <clears throat> Eventually he tells me his real name is Brian. I feel genuinely honored that I've been chosen as both his ping pong partner and his confidant. As our ping pong marathon continued late into the afternoon, I see now that Brian isn't some uber tough, scary Shrek of the streets slinging dope all over town. He's just caught up in the clutches of his addiction, just like me. In reality, he's just a big dude with a good street name and a bad habit. Just like I'm not this bewildered, battered woman or some sneaky mastermind hustling tweakers outside Rite Aid. We're both just playing the characters we have to play to survive. Neither of us are as good or as bad as these mythical characters we invented. We're just two grown-ass humans who deep down are still lost little kids seeking solace and simple pleasures, like endless games of ping pong at a rec center. It's the end of the day and the rec center's closing. It's time for traffic and I to go our separate ways. Brian gives me this giant bear hug goodbye. He texts me a few days later to see if I'm okay. I never responded and I don't ever see him again. Four years later, I still drive by the Adams Avenue Rec Center almost every single day. And without fail, I think about that day with Brian. I really hope the Shrek of the Streets made it out like I did. Addict tip number seven, get the fuck out while you still can and go tell people your story. <laughs> that was Jessica Ruain. Good stuff, good stuff. How y'all feeling, ladies and gentlemen? How y'all feeling? 
All right, all right. Another successful vamp in the books, ladies and gentlemen. Want to give out some thank yous, of course, for making it such a successful show. Uh, I want to thank our volunteers, uh, Rachel Holt, Vicky Chavez, Whitney Rue Smith, uh, Frank De Palermo, Killian Whitlock, and Billy Piper. Thank you very much, fam. Give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Give us some love. Volunteers. That's freestyle, fam. That's not pay styles. Uh, I'd like to thank our coaches as well, Rachel Medlock, David Latham, Betsy Morrow, Heidi Lang, Kelly Bowen, Dallas McLaughlin, Eber Lambert, and Brent Hanafi pulling double duty, ladies and gentlemen. Give, give it up. Give it up. And, of course, I want to give some love to our performers. Uh, of course, Brett Hennepin, uh, Jared Wolf from Lucky Pence, Joe Hudak, Justin Hutnell, Leo Deckelbaum, and Jessica Ruane. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up. Uh, thank you once again. Again, don't be afraid to come out them pockets. Uh, today's episode was made possible by the WM Keck Foundation and by viewers like you. Remember to tip your bartender and thank you, Whistle Stop, and thank you all for coming out. Good night.